Good morning, everybody. Dear colleagues, I'm very pleased that so many of you are interested in this webinar. My name is Susanne Blumesberger. I had the repository management department FITRA services at the University of Vienna and coordinate the network for repository managers, RepManet. The event series uh, Research Data Management in Austria is aimed at researchers and or research support staff and serves as a networking and exchange platform on the topic of managing research data, writing a data management plan and similar related topics. We have now held several webinars, most recently for the humanities. Another webinar will be dedicated to the life sciences. The webinar series on research data management in Austria is hosted by the Fair Data Austria project, by WebManet, the network for repository managers, UANA, the Open Science Network Austria, and the FWF, the Austrian Science Fund. Today, we have also Austria, the Austrian Social Science Data Archive with us, because today we are specifically talking about research data management in the social sciences. I'm very pleased that we are able to get two experts today, namely Lisa Hönecker from Austria and Katja Meyer, a sociologist. Both colleagues have prepared a presentation, but we have also planned enough time for questions and discussion. Please feel free to post any question in the chat. We will be happy to provide you with the slides afterwards. The event will be recorded so that it can be reused. Now I would like to briefly introduce Lisa Hönecker and ask her for her presentation. Lisa Hönecker um, will talk about research data management in the social sciences, foundations, challenges, and support. She manages OSTA, the Austrian Social Science Data Archive, a national infrastructure at the Universities of Vienna, Graz, Linz, and Innsbruck for archiving social science research data and supports the development of the European Open Science Cloud through H2020 projects. So please, uh, Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, so um, hello everybody. Um, I will be covering the first part of the presentation today. Uh, we will be discussing the basics of RDM in general and uh, the challenges in social sciences and then also the support uh, in terms of services and infrastructure that exists. So RDM is becoming uh, more and more important um, and it's also becoming more mandatory, uh, for example, by funding bodies or institutions with uh, regulations and policies on uh, making data available, making data fair or writing a data management plan, for example, uh, but also uh, becoming more uh, important in the community itself uh, with the changing practice towards open science. And uh, this is why we want to give you some more information on RDM today uh, with uh, this uh, discipline specific focus on the social sciences. And uh, to start with, I want to give you an overview of what I have included in my presentation today. And if we can move on to the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So uh, we will start with the basics. Uh, what is RDM? What is the use of research data management and what is the goal? Uh, we will then take a look at the research cycle and uh, the steps and tasks along the way and then try and see how RDM fits into this uh, existing process of, uh, of research. And uh, then we will specifically also discuss the FAIR principles. Uh, so what do they mean, but also how do we comply to the FAIR principles and um, how can we put them into practice? We will also address uh, the challenges and this is where the discipline specific focus comes in. So uh, with data and research data management, the requirements are very different in different disciplines and they vary a lot across different data types and also depending on the content of the data. And there is not uh, this one process that fits all data in RDM. So today we're looking at a typical challenge in um, RDM in the social sciences. And here I would like to focus on the challenge with uh, dealing with personal data. So when we discuss social science data, we almost always are um, talking about personal data and this is where the GDPR comes in. So this will be the challenge that we focus on today. And there are uh, three steps along the way that facilitate data sharing that I wanna focus on. And this is the consent of uh, participants, 
than the pseudonymization of data. And lastly, before making data available, uh, setting appropriate access restrictions to protect the data. We will discuss um, all of these aspects in more detail separately, but then also um, kind of try and see how they all fit together and are important. And I would like to make the case that data sharing is possible also in social science with personal data if certain measures and safeguards are in place. The third part of the presentation will then focus on uh, the support that there is and that can be used, especially by uh, researchers. So what kind of infrastructure is there and what kind of services can we offer, especially for social sciences in, in the Austrian landscape. And this is why I want to present the services, especially that we have at AUSTA, the Austrian Social Science Data Archive. So um, our core business is making data available and archiving data. And here I am going to present how this process looks when uh, you have data that you want to make fair and you want to archive um, from the first contact with us until we are able to archive and publish this data. And the last point uh, will be just a short conclusion on how you can get ahead and how you can realize all these aspects of research data management and include this uh, into your research practice. So now we can start uh, with the first part of the presentation, the basics. So just some general information on what research management is. Um, research data management is basically the organization of data in the entire research cycle. Uh, it starts with uh, at the very beginning with the planning of what kind of data is being collected and how this data is being processed uh, from the start, uh, but then goes all the way to the end of a research project when this data then is archived and possibly also made available for reuse. And uh, the goal with uh, these practices in RDM is making data fair. Uh, this is a rather central term in RDM and social sciences. And I will explain this on one of the next slides in more detail and then also try and uh, uh, show you some, some examples and some measures on how we can uh, put FAIR into practice. Uh, but first, on the next slide, I would like to take a look at the typical research cycle and um, try and see how um, important aspects that are also very often requirements of RDM uh, fit into this process. Uh, so this is what we want to focus on today in the presentations. Um, on the one aspect, in the very beginning, you have uh, the planning stage. Um, and this is a very uh, typical requirement, uh, for example, with uh, writing a data management plan at the very beginning of a project. And then at the very end, um, making data fair uh, and making data available for reuse. And this is what I will focus on in my presentation, as this is the core business of the Austrian Social Science Data Archive. Um, on the next slide, um, I have some more information about the FAIR principles. Um, as I said before, this is a very central term in research data management in general, and the FAIR principles are um, always very prominent, and it's basically the overall goal to, goal to make the data FAIR. Uh, FAIR means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And there are several measures that can be taken to make data fair. And I've included some examples on the slide on the right side. So to ensure findability uh, is basically to support that uh, the data is findable, that other researchers know that this data exists and that they know where it exists. And to make data accessible, it is important to have clear access options and uh, to be transparent about these options. So just clarifying who can access the data, who has the rights, uh, but also on a more technical aspect, how can then uh, this, access, uh, this data be accessed. To be interoperable, um, it's important to make sure that the data can be processed uh, with existing tools and software, for example. And finally, to make data reusable um, means implementing measures so that the data can, um, on the one hand side, be understood, but then on the other side, also that you have the rights um, then to reuse the data. And to put this a little bit more into practice, um, I would like to explain what this then actually means at um, our infrastructure at AUSTA, because this is uh, then the final conclusion. Um, there seems to be a lot of uh, additional measures to be taken and a lot of uh, additional work. But I think uh, the good news here is that um, most repositories cover these aspects and they help you with aligning your data with the FAIR principles. So, for example, at AUSTA, this would mean um, to make data findable. Oh, sorry, if we can stick with the slide just a little bit longer. Thank you. So, to make data findable, uh, we assign a DUI, a digital object identifier, to the data and uh, documentation. 
We also help with completing metadata and we make sure that you use standardized vocabulary to describe the data. Um, our catalog um, as a whole digital archive is um, harvested by European data catalog. And then these resources, again, they fall into the European Open Science Cloud. So this ensures that the data becomes more visible, more findable, and also on a European level. To make uh, data accessible, we have a clear access policy. So we recommend to be as open as possible in general uh, with our access options, but as close as necessary. And this is a very essential principle that uh, we are aligned with. And I will focus on this aspect a little bit later because um, we are trying to support uh, open access in general. But as, as I said, there are challenges, especially in social science with uh, dealing with personal data. You need to be able to also protect um, individuals and uh, need to be aligned with uh, data protection regulations. So this is why you need to be as close as necessary. Uh, to be interoperable, um, this uh, would mean with us that we transform the data files into other common data formats um, so that the community can widely use it. So, for example, in the social sciences, uh, we receive uh, a lot of SPSS files in the quantitative social sciences, and we also convert it to a SATA file and other non-proprietary formats so it can be as widely reused as possible. And uh, to the final aspect, to, to make data reusable, uh, in general, we use um, open and creative common licenses, but we also have established a specific and tailored license for scientific reuse of the data. And here in this area, it's just most important to make the reuse rights clear so that people who find the data and access the data and then want to work with the data know uh, what rights do they have? Are they allowed to analyze the data? Are they allowed to publish the data and so on and so forth? And we also make sure that data deposits are accompanied with materials that explain the data. That can be any additional documentation that makes the data understandable to people who were not part of the research process or of the research team that collected the data. So, for example, that can be a method report or a questionnaire or any additional information just helping to understand uh, the data. Yes, and to sum up, so... Um, repositories in general are aligning themselves along the FAIR principles and infrastructures in general. So there's no clear threshold of when data is FAIR or when an infrastructure is FAIR, but uh, basically everybody's trying to support um, to make the data FAIR. And I think this is an important um, aspect for uh, you as researchers also, because you can get a lot of support um, to put these FAIR princ principles into practice with uh, the research infrastructure. And um, now, after talking about all these additional uh, measures and to do, what are then the benefits? And now can we can move on to the next slide, please. So what are the benefits of all this additional work? Uh, and I think a lot of interest in RDM is due to additional regulations. Um, and when following these uh, RDM practices, it helps you to comply to a lot of these regulations that are coming from funders, that are coming from institutions themselves, but also more and more from journals when you want to publish your articles. And planning in general, um, which is the first, usually the first step, is is a good um, good tool or just a good process to help you upfront and maybe avoid uh, problems later on in your um, RDM process, especially when uh, the requirement at the end is to make your data available and make your data fair. There are of course also other benefits, uh, so I've just uh, included some of them here on the slide. So. Um, it can lead to more visibility and more impact for your research. Uh, the data is being recognized as an essential part of the work, as a lot of resources from the research process actually uh, flow into the data uh, gathering and collection and curation and so on. And the data um, gets an identifier and decidable, and then it's kind of this uh, own piece um, of work and output. The visibility of data can foster collaboration. Uh, so data can be shared um, more easily. It can be shared across uh, disciplines and um, is more visible in general and not only within uh, the community or an existing uh, network that is often practiced. RDM helps you yourself also to secure and preserve your work. Uh, so all the data, when it is curated and the documentation is added and all this is then uh, preserved, it stays available for a long time. And finally, on a very uh, broad scale, uh, with uh, data sharing becoming a wider practice, um, a very general additional benefit, I would say, is uh, 
more data becoming available and getting access to more data on a global scale is uh, one important additional benefit. Moving on to the next part, and this is where we want to focus more on the challenges that arise and um, again, focusing more on what RDM actually means for social science data. And here the focus lies on this question of data sharing on the one hand side, which is a requirement or which you want to do, and then data protection on the other side, which is also a very general requirement and uh, trying to find this, this balance between these rather uh, diverging requirements. And um, we can start with a short introduction about personal data. So uh, when we are talking about social science research, we are often dealing with personal data. And this is most likely one of the biggest challenges when uh, trying to make data available. So when you talk about personal data, this means that the GDPR applies, the General Data Protection Regulation, and there's just this uh, responsibility to protect the privacy of individuals. And just up front, if uh, your data is not personal data, if your data is anonymous, then GDPR does not apply and it is much more easy um, to share your data. But uh, since in social sciences, we are often dealing with individuals, uh, we are often dealing with, uh, for example, survey data, where we ask individuals um, about their information, about their opinions, then we're talking about personal data. And I've included the definition of the GDPR on the slide, and I think it makes uh, one difference very clear that is important in RDM and social sciences, and this is that there are direct and indirect identifiers. And um, this leads to uh, it often not being clear if the data is personal or not, and therefore also not clear if and how data can be shared, and there are a lot of insecurities around this topic. So when you look at um, direct identifiers, it's, it's rather very clear what this is. So this can be one information that leads um, directly to one individual. So for example, the name or an address or um, an online identifier that could be an IP address. And then you have a direct identifier and it's very clear that we're talking about personal data. But then uh, when you don't have this one aspect, uh, but you have several and more factors that lead to or possibly lead to the re-identification of individuals, then we're talking about indirect identifiers. And this is um, what is usually also included in social science data sets when it is uh, tried to make this data available and fair. Um, so this collection of information um, that is included in social science data sets, um, including indirect identifiers that can lead to the identification of a person. Um, so for example, again, if we look at uh, a survey data set where you collect information on different aspects, and even though you don't include the name or the address, which would be direct identifiers, you um, most probably include information such as uh, gender or age, residence, region, where people live, um, where people are employed, um, their job descriptions, and so on and so forth. And if you look at this information individually, it's probably not identifying, um, but collectively it can make it possible to identify the person. And this is then when we are talking about uh, personal data. And this is where we need to take GDPR into account, especially when we want to make this data fair and make it available. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, um, there you have an overview on the right side of the slide on what personal data can be. And another important aspect here is not only personal data, but also special categories of personal data. And this is uh, what is formerly known as sensitive data. And when you deal with this kind of data, uh, which is also often the case in social science data sets, then special measures need to be taken to ensure data protection because uh, this data is considered to be more sensitive and needs more protection. So, um, for example, in social science data, these special categories of data are included if you conduct a study about political opinion or voting, about religious beliefs or sexual orientation, for example. So this is all specified in the GDPR that this is special categories of personal data. And then we need to provide for uh, suitable and specific measures to safeguard uh, this data. And now that we have all these uh, data protection rules in mind, and we know that we're dealing with personal data that needs this protection, we know that we are also dealing with uh, special categories of personal data that need this kind of extra protection. How can we then make data sharing possible? And I think this is uh, the big question that we want to address today. 
And um, on the next slide, I have three measures included that I want to talk to um, individually. Um, but it, basically, I want to show that um, these can all be measures that make uh, data sharing possible, even though we're talking about uh, personal data or special categories of personal data. So these three measures that I want to present are um, getting the consent from participants. Um, for example, if you conduct uh, a survey, an online survey, for example. Uh, the second part would be the pseudonymization of data in the process of data curation, so after you have collected the data. And then at the very end, just before making uh, data available for reuse or publishing data in a repository, choosing the right access restriction, again, as a measure to protect this data. So um, starting with the first measure, I want to present this in a little bit more detail because this is usually part of the very beginning um, of a social science uh, research uh, process. So before you conduct a survey, um, it is important to uh, establish this informed consent with the participants. Um, informed consent is an ethical aspect of good scientific practice. But most importantly, here in this context, it's also a legal basis uh, to process personal data. And in general, when you're processing personal data and with processing, um, it's, in, it's everything is included. So the collection, the an analyzing, even the deleting of data is processing. And if you do this with personal data, then you need to have a legal basis. This is regulated in the GDPR. And one of this legal basis can be getting the consent from participants. And to get the consent from participants, you need to give information on uh, what your research project is, what data is collected, how this data is processed. You should include who has access to the data, uh, where and for long, for how long this data is saved, and then what part is deleted and what part is kept. And um, these are just all informations to make sure that the participants um, can make an informed decision. So another aspect that is important is to use easy and understandable language um, so that people can understand uh, what happens to the data and then actively and informed give you a consent that they agree to this processing of data. And an aspect that is almost always missing or uh, very often missing is um, to include the information that the data will be archived and published for reuse in these um, consent forms. And I guess this is a rather new process or addition or also not often uh, planned into the research process at the very beginning. So this is something that is uh, important to think about at the very beginning of your research process because you can only get informed consent before you start collecting uh, the research data. And on the next slide, I have included a couple of examples of formulations that we have encountered in uh, informed consent sheets. And on the left side, uh, you see a couple of examples uh, or formulations um, that don't include the archiving and the publishing of data um, or even include aspects that I would say negate the data sharing. So, for example, it says that uh, data will not be shared outside of the project team or it states that data will not be published or it says also that data will only be published in an aggregated form. So, for example, in summarizing the results in a frequency table or in a report. And on the right side of the slide, I have tried to include a proposition that um, includes all these aspects to make uh, this informed consent with uh, the information that the data then will be made fair and be made available. So it states that the data will be shared outside of the project team. It states that this data will be published and also will be published in a certain kind of way. So here in a pseudonymized way, um, via, in this case, um, just as an example, via the Social Science Data Archive, AUSTA. And this brings me to the next aspect and measure on the way, let's say, from uh, data protection to data sharing, which is the pseudonymization of personal data. And this will be uh, the next slide, uh, the second part of the presentation. So what is the pseudonymization and what is it good for? So it's basically, in social science, uh, the central element that allows us to share and publish this data. So pseudonymized data is protecting the privacy as it is not allowing um, for people to be um, re-identified by people who are not uh, within the research team. So um, there are, it's just one way to um, 
be able to to share this data in a meaningful way and to not um, um, delete every information that can be useful in scientific research, but also uh, to not um, have participants re-identified. And in general, there are no uh, clear and complete rules for all data types and data contents um, on how to pseudonymize the data, as this always depends on the whole content and on how much individual information is in there and on uh, what kind of uh, aggregation level the information is in there. But there are some uh, general guidelines that can be followed. And one way to pseudonymize the data would be deleting information. Uh, so mostly this should be applied for information that is no longer needed. Uh, another aspect could be to substitute information with a pseudonym. So this um, would, for example, be more um, the practice with uh, qualitative social science data when you want to pseudonymize an interview transcript, for example, where you swap uh, the name of a participant with another name and therefore um, not make it possible to uh, be re-identified. The third option um, is more relevant for uh, the curation and the pseudonymization of quantitative social science data, and this would be the aggregation of data. So, for example, if you have a lot of indirect identifiers, let's say um, the year of birth, uh, you would not need to include it, uh, for example, with the actual year, but you can aggregate it um, towards a cohort of five or ten years. And then this um, also helps with uh, pseudonymizing the data as it becomes more difficult to re-identify these measures. And uh, what is very important with the pseudonymization of personal data is always that um, this uh, key, or um, it can be a specific key, or it can be any additional information that allows for re-identification, um, is kept separately from the data itself. And you need to ensure adequate technical and organizational measures uh, to make sure that people who are not allowed to access this data um, and key together, so with the key you can re-identify individuals in a data set, that they, um, this is kept separately and nobody can access it who does not have the rights. And in a research team, this would, for example, mean that you keep these two information uh, parts in separate locations. And for us at the archive, uh, this can, for example, mean that uh, you as a researcher who wants to archive your data only uh, submits the data set that is uh, pseudonymized and not the additional information um, that somebody could use to re-identify people. And then this is not published. And in this way, uh, the data would be pseudonymous. And also just as an additional information, as long as this key or any additional information exists to kind of combine again uh, the data set with uh, the individuals and make this re-identification possible, we are always talking about personal data. So pseudonymous data is always personal data. The data is not anonymous as long as there is the slightest possibility that uh, the re-identification can still be done. And that brings me to the last point or the last measure on the way to making uh, data sharing possible in social science and with personal data, which is um, choosing access restrictions. And um, in the first uh, in the first stage, this sounds like, okay, again, we want to make data sharing possible and we are restricting the access options. We're restricting who gets access to the data. But this would be considered one additional measure in case uh, the risk of re-identification is considered higher, then you can choose um, higher access restrictions. If the re-identification risk is considered uh, very low, then you don't have to be as restrictive. So this is where this uh, principle comes in as open as possible, but as closed as necessary, which is very central uh, with social science data. There are many different access options available in different repositories. Um, so I've included the typical ones on the slide here that can range from completely open, uh, which would be open access where everybody can download the data and there's usually no traceability. Then it can be a little bit more restrictive, um, for example, with group-based or account-based. Uh, so group-based would be an access option where based on your characteristic um, as, for example, researcher you have then access to this data. So the group would be researchers. Or account-based, this can be um, if you have access to an institutional account, to an um, institutional account from a scientific institution, then you can be granted access based on this criteria. And then there are various other forms of uh, restricted or even more restricted access options. 
and there are various differences um, across uh, different repositories. And one important um, aspect of choosing the access restrictions is, of course, um, to safeguard the data if this is deemed necessary. But on the other hand, that it's also um, an option to raise more awareness about data protection with potential reuses of data, which I would see as an additional benefit um, to protect this. And again, um, all these measures seem like a lot of additional work, uh, additional work for researchers, but there are a lot of support services and support infrastructure that can be used. And uh, this is one, uh, what I want to present to you on the next slides um, with um, our archive, so the Austrian Social Science Data Archive. We are a national and certified research infrastructure and we are tailored towards the social sciences. So. Um, I would say this is a very good option if um, you need RDM support in the social sciences and you want to make your data fair and available um, in the social sciences, then um, we have a couple of services that can be of use to you. Um, I have them listed on the next slide. Uh, you can see an overview. So we have uh, a DUI service. So if you want to make your data available, um, we can register a DUI for you for your data and documentation. We help you with uh, data license choosing and management. So we have different license, license options and we can discuss them with you based on the needs um, of your data. We also offer secure and long-term archiving and uh, this includes also the preservation of your data and data files. We do pseudonymization checks. So this is an additional check to ensure that uh, data protection regulations are followed and that there's no risk to your uh, to the participants of your study, for example. Uh, we have different data access options from um, open and open access to uh, more restricted. We also support with uh, data management in general. If you have any questions about RDM in the social sciences and um, if you are a potential reuser of data, we also help you with uh, the data search in our digital archive and our repository. And in general, we um, also promote data reuse in general, and we try to increase visibility of uh, your data publications as well. How would this look like if you want to make data available with uh, Austa? So I've included the process on the next slide, and you can see here the overview. Uh, we would start uh, with the first contact and a consultancy. So this is where we talk about what kind of data you have, um, what kind of issues arise, what is your timeline, what do you want to do, what part of your data do you want to um, make available, you want to make fair and you want to archive. And once we have figured this out, we uh, talk about the contract and the license. So the contract would be the contract between you as a data depositor and us as an archive. And the license would then be the license that is uh, put on the data and documentation um, which is then the license with uh, the potential uh, reuses or the end users. Once this is all figured out, um, you can submit your data and metadata to us. And then we start with uh, the curation. So this includes a couple of checks and most importantly, the pseudonymization checks where we then also give you feedback and if necessary, ask for some kind of adjustments. And once you resubmit your data to us again, then we start with the preservation process. So this includes uh, transforming your data into other data uh, files and formats and also to, uh, into long-term uh, files. And once this is concluded, we then include the uh, data set entry into our digital archive, and then we can publish and archive your data and your data then has a DUI and is um, available according to, this, uh, to the access restrictions that we chose to give. Okay, thank you. Um, and to sum up on the next slide. Um, so what are the opportunities to get ahead in RDM and how does this all becomes manageable? Because it seems like a lot of uh, additional burden or additional tasks that uh, need to be done. And here I mainly want to stress uh, two aspects. And the one important thing is really good planning is very essential for this whole process. And this is where the data management plan comes in as an important tool. And this will also be then the second session here today. Um, and the other part is if you want to uh, make your data fair, if you want to make your data available, 
uh, use a trustworthy and certified repository and if possible also discipline specific because with a discipline specific repository we can um, accommodate the needs of, of the data a little bit better. And here um, also is a national infrastructure um, and it's offering services for the whole social science community in Austria. So we have these kind of services and um, we are always trying to expand and uh, are happy to help. So if there are any questions that arise that we cannot uh, clear up after the presentation now, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, we're always happy to help. And the contact I think is on the next slide. And this is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your interesting presentation. Uh, in the chat, we have some questions now. The first one is, um, my experience is that every single step of the FAIR principles already requires a considerable amount of knowledge and digital skills. For example, how an API works. I would say that for quite some qualitative social scientists, this is an important obstacle. Is this a common experience? And Katja Meyer uh, says that, uh, yes, uh, I think indeed this is a challenge for everybody. Um, would you like to add something, uh, Lisa? I think it is a challenge for everybody, of course. Um, it's also a challenge for us. Um, but I think what is important here is that um, as a researcher, you're not always required to do every step yourself. So infrastructures are here to support you in this way. And a lot of uh, measures that need to be taken to put FAIR into practice are actually not or don't really need to be done by the researchers, but are also done by the research infrastructure. So I think this is where the support structure comes in and, and kind of helps in these uh, overwhelming and very challenging measures. OK, thank you. Uh, the second question is, uh, maybe I misunderstood the data protection regulation. Doesn't the need to explicitly de uh, define users of the data required under DSVGO clash directly with open data platforms? Uh, yes, so this is a rather complex topic, um, but um, this is true. So the specific um, requirement or the specific uh, use that you can agree to as a data subject um, does not or is considered not to be aligned with uh, completely open access, um, open data platforms. So this is why we differentiate here at AUSA as well. Most uh, social science data uh, we're not making available with an open access license or completely open for reuse. But there is this exception, um, so there's a lot more allowed for the scientific reuse of social science data, and this is um, how we can make this data still available for scientific reuse as a more specific purpose. And for open access, for example, at our um, archive, um, we only um, publish data that is completely anonymous. So, and if data is anonymous, then you're not no longer um, under the GDPR, and then um, this is no longer an issue. Okay, so Stephanie writes, I also feel the effort necessary to make social science data truly fair is something very hard to manage, especially when you do not have a clear plan from the very beginning of data collection. Alignment within a project consortium is also a challenge. Yes, I can only agree. Um, it's a challenge, but again, it's, it's the same um, argument as before, not everything has to be done by the researcher, but planning, of course, I want to stress here as well, and this will be uh, the second part of the presentation, is important. So if you plan well ahead and if you plan through the whole process, you can avoid a lot of problems later on. So this is something that is really, I think, essential and it's, it's a good reason that data management plans are required and are becoming more and more important because they are a useful tool to not have as many challenges later on. The next very interesting question is, removing indirect personal identifiers often makes the qualitative data unintelligible or reusable. How can we tackle this? And Katja says that maybe the data on this level is then not shareable, she asked. Uh, yeah, um, so um, 
with qualitative data, there are a lot more challenges. So um, also, for example, most data repositories and we had also as well, we uh, in the beginning focused um, mostly on quantitative data because it is more easy to manage this issue and then still make data available that is uh, useful for reuse. With qualitative data, I wouldn't say in general that um, no qualitative data can be pseudonymized and then uh, it's no longer usable. I don't think that is the case, but I think it depends on and very much on uh, what kind of qualitative data we're talking about. Um, what is the content of the data? For example, the very typical uh, example of when it doesn't make sense to pseudonymize qualitative data would be in uh, biography research, because there's so much information that relates directly or indirectly to a person. If you remove all this, then uh, what you end up with is not really useful to share and then it just takes a, up a lot of resources to make this uh, shareable but you cannot actually do a lot with it but i think it depends uh, very much on on the content of the data and this is something that needs to be decided um, on a rather individual level of if it makes sense to still share this data or if it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. Also, content into use for scientific purposes seems too bold. And Katya says the question of content for further not yet known reuse of data is indeed tricky, also in relation to the GDPR. Yeah, I can only add that this is uh, really tricky and this is a rather complex topic. There are uh, different uh, opinions, there are different legal views. If scientific purpose is uh, defined enough or if it's too broad, then there's also this um, concept of uh, the broad consent that is possible only for scientific reuse. So there is a, a big discussion going on, but um, in general, um, I would say that for scientific purpose, um, either the informed consent or the broad consent can serve as a concept, um, as a legal concept that we can uh, build upon. Heidi Leonhardt asks, do you suggest to make the content for data reuse compulsory for participants? For example, if there is no content, the data will not be collected or include, this is an option without, with opt-out possibility in a content form. The latter will be increase uh, difficulties in data handling, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there are different uh, options to go ahead. Um, I would argue that if you want to make your data fair, and if this is already in the a plan in the beginning, not only from a legal standpoint, point, but also from an ethical standpoint, you should inform your participants that this is happening with their data because it's an important part and aspect of how this data will be processed um, further. Um, you can also include this as an option with opt-out. We, we did have that as well, but as you also say here in the chat, this increases difficulties because you then you need to handle the data in different ways. You need to make sure to abs absolutely um, follow then uh, what people consent to and what people do not consent to. Um, I would in general suggest that if uh, you already plan to make your data available, that you include it um, as uh, specifically as possible in uh, the information sheet that you usually provide when uh, getting informed and active consent from your participants. The next question, what if it is impossible to pseudonymize the data, for example, data on political elites? This is um, also a very tricky question because uh, we have based our whole legal uh, concept on how we can uh, share the data. And this is with the pseudonymization because this way we can protect individuals. Um, if it's not possible to pseudonymize the data, um, then this would probably not be an option to um, share in the current system that we have with the current access option. There would be possibly uh, an option to share this data in, in another way. Um, for example, when you have uh, more risk uh, with this kind of uh, measures I wanted to, to explain, then um, at the end, you can kind of uh, put more access restrictions on because, for example, there are a lot more restrictive access, access options that uh, exist in general. For example, the most restrictive access options at, uh, at AUSTA is um, people can request access. 
for the more restricted restrictive access uh, data, sorry, data um, holdings. And then we check uh, whether or not um, this uh, request is um, eligible. So if people have a specific purpose on why they want to reuse this exact data for their research, and then we check this manually, and then we grant access or we don't grant access. So this is the most restrictive form that we have. Um, there are other types. For example, there could be a data safe center where, where you um, can uh, access data only on a specific location with uh, certain safeguard measures and you're not able to download anything and you're not able to send anything and you can only um, for example do uh, your calculations um, there remotely and then um, only use the results so this would be another way of data sharing when there's more risk involved but this um, is not a very common option that is available so um, in general sharing data that is not pseudonymized is uh is an issue i would say and i don't really have a solution for that the next interesting question uh where does indirectly identifiable begin for example can i attribute interview information to a public official working in a certain department when there may only be a small number of people working Yes, for example, if you have information on a person and you say this person works at this office and then you look at the website and um, you have five employees and you say the name of this institution and then you have another indirect identifier, which is the gender and the age or any additional information like this, this would be a perfect example of how this person can indirectly be identified. Mm -hmm. And Edith is interested in OSTA. She asked, uh, you said OSTA helps with publishing the data. Could you please specify this a little bit more, how and where? Okay, so uh, we have a digital repository, which is the OSTA Dataverse. Um, and I can share the link later as well. So this is where all our data holdings um, are archived and are also accessible. And the way we help is kind of with this process I uh, tried to uh, show before on the slide. So if you want to make your data, um, if you want to archive your data and publish your data with Auster, you, uh, you come to us and then we discuss on uh, what kind of data you have. Um, and as we already see, uh, uh, based on all these questions in the chat, uh, there are a lot of different aspects in every data set that need to be looked at. And we then kind of try and figure out what are the potential issues here and how can we still share the data always thinking in this process, we need to protect um, individuals, but then um, we also want to make this data available. So we um, talk about the content, we talk about the possible license that could be used in most cases with social science data. It is a license for scientific reuse and not uh, completely open access. And um, when we have uh, this license and contract figured out, so the contract is also an important part. So this is clarifying who has the rights to data. And this is also a very complex uh, topic because this is not very clear. It uh, depends on your institutional background. Um, but in most cases, uh, the institution that you work for as a researcher probably has the usage rights to your data. And then we need to try and figure that out and then uh, get all the necessary signatures uh, so that you also have the right to license this data and you have the right to, the right to publish this data. And once everything um, here is concluded, um, you then give us your data and we just uh, take a look and we start with all our data checks. And um, most important here is the data checks on pseudonymization. So to make sure that we cannot identify any individuals within the data set. Um, and then we give you feedback. If there's something that needs to be adjusted, uh, we ask you to please change that or if, especially if it concerns data protection, if it's um, other remarks that we have, um, you can change it, but you, you're not obliged to. But for example, it's always a good check because we at the archive, we're not part of the uh, research team. So we only have the information that a potential reuser at the end has. We have the data set and we have the additional documentation and the metadata. And if we cannot make use of the data or if there are aspects that we don't understand, um, it's probably necessary to uh, do some adjustments or to add some documentation or some other additional information. And this is what we would feedback to you so th that you can um, increase the quality of your data set and your data files. 
And uh, once this is concluded, the preservation of the data, this takes uh, part on our side. So this is conducted by the OSTA staff. There are a couple of procedures that are followed to make sure, for example, that the data file that we have today can, all, can also be used in 10 years or in 20 years and uh, make sure that it's not a problem with uh, the format or if it's a proprietary, proprietary file or non-proprietary file. So it's it's kind of a process that we do at the archive and we transform the files uh, into a long-term files. And afterwards, yeah, we include the data set and the data entry with all the metadata and all additional information into our uh, dataverse, which is our digital archive again. And then we publish and then you can see it um, online with the DUI and you can always cite it. Um, yeah. I can include the link so that people can take a look who are interested. So I have included the link um, in the chat and you can take a look and then you see different uh, data verses. This is a term for a collection of data sets that uh, kind of thematically belong together. And then you have the individual data sets in and then some of them you will see that you can just download their open access and the additional documentation is always open access or most always open access and you can just download it and for some of the little bit more restrictive data sets you need to register an account or log in with your institutional account and then this um, button where it now says request access changes to a download button so then you can also download this data and when it becomes more restrictive, um, then uh, you can request access to the data. Then you will get a form from us where you state why you need this data, what you want to do with it, and how this fits into your research process. And then we will check this, and then we will manually grant you access to the data. OK. Um, the next question from Tatiana is um, if there are some examples or templates of data management plans available. Or can we uh, contact Oster for thinking about doing this before data collection? And Thomas uh, just put a link um, to this to a template collection in the chat. And I can also add that we have also a collection of data management plans in our uh, institutional repository in Fedra, and I can put also the link in the chat afterwards. So you can also um, have a look at these uh, examples. And so, I want to add yeah. that there's also uh, one additional template uh, that we have available for a DMP in the social sciences, and it's also available on Synodo, and um, can share the link later on as well. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so the next question is, um, if my data is super revealing that it contains much direct and indirect sensitive information, could I still put it on the OSTA? but with high access restriction on my data so that researchers have to register and so on. That way, one does not have to pseudonymize data and keeps all the info. And please, uh, that, uh, no. that, that part of the question is also, uh, that here's the answers. Okay, so uh, no. So our legal concept is that we pseudonymize all the data. Um, there is a little bit, it is a little bit of a difficult, uh, term and concept because it's difficult to say when uh, data is really uh, pseudonymized. Uh, but in general, we cannot put any information where there are a lot of direct identifiers or any, ident any identifiers um, that are direct into our data sets. So this is not how we can share data. We always uh, need to pseudonymize the data, but then if we consider the risk or not only the risk of re-identification, but also once a uh, person is re-identified, what is the risk then for this person? Because this also depends if there's, uh, for example, just a name and then the other information is not so sensitive, the risk is potentially not this big. But then if you talk about uh, very sensitive topics and uh, things like uh, religion and politics and everything that uh, falls under this category of special categories of personal data, then uh, we need to be a little bit more restrictive here as well. So if you cannot, or if you want, or if you cannot uh, pseudonymous the data at all, then we would not uh, be able to uh, make it available, even to the research community. Thank you, Lisa. There's another question um, 
concerning the reuse, how exactly does the reusing work? Who and for what purposes can the data be used? For example, could someone publish an article with data from such a repository? And how would that be handled in terms of authorship? Uh, yes, so you can use the data and then you can use it for any kind of analysis uh, that you want. This is usually specified in the license, but uh, the license for scientific reuse covers everything that falls under scientific reuse, uh, which we would be, of course, to analyze it and then publish an article. The authorship is not a problem in this case because you are the author of the article that you write. This has nothing to do with the data. And uh, the data itself, there is another big discussion about um, is there ownership in itself on the data and then who has this ownership because um, data in itself is usually not, uh, does not fall under copyright. So it's not a typical thing of who is the author or is, is there authorship of, uh, I mean, there is authorship of data but not in the sense that this is then protected in the same way um, an article that you publish um, would be protected. And if you write the article yourself, just based on the data that you reuse, then of course um, you are the author of that article and you can publish this. Okay. Um, there's a question, um, how can you assess if the data is worth publishing? Seems like a lot of work for making data accessible that in the end never be used. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, to add, there are two aspects I think that make data worth publishing. It's not only the reuse aspect, but it's also the aspect of being uh, transparent in your research and um, just showing or making people um, understand what uh, processes you followed and what um, your assumptions uh, in your articles are based on. So this is also an important um, aspect of making data available. But considering more this question of um, when data is worth making available, because of course there are a lot of resources that flow into this, um, this is not something I can answer, I think. I mean, we have some requirements because, of course, we have limited resources. There's always some manual work to be done when archiving data. So um, our limit, for example, would be um, starting at um, the PhD level that we uh, assess data. And maybe another aspect of this question would be, I mean, there are some really big um, social science infrastructure programs where uh, more reuse is expected. And then this is, of course, um, very important to make available. Um, and then some research questions and the data underlying are very specific, targeted towards a spe very specific question and does not include a lot of other information. Then the reuse options might uh, not be as broad. But then in the end, um, you never know what somebody might be able to use. So we have also found this because we can kind of uh, track how often a data set is uh, downloaded in our digital archive. So sometimes um, we can also see download numbers for data sets um, that are very narrow and that don't include a lot of information. But mostly, of course, um, the broader the topics and the more information that is gathered in a data set, um, there is also a lot of uh, more reuse. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you also, Teresa, Barbara, Katrina, and Stephanie for the links they put in to the templates. Um, are there any other questions? If not, um, so I would like to say thank you very much to Lisa. Thank you. As well. <laughs> thank you. And now we. Um, go to Katja Meyer. She will talk about data management plan and practical examples from the social sciences. Katja Meyer is a sociologist at the Vienna Center for Social Innovation and runs the uh, FWF project Politics of Openness, Open Data Practices in the Computational Social Sciences at the Institute for Science and Technology Studies at the University of Vienna. Katja, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to to speak a little bit from uh, yeah from the ground, from the field, from the everyday experience. And uh, yeah, it was great also to follow your presentation, Lisa. I I, I learned a lot, and I I think uh, in in my past at least I have uh, tried not enough to get help from 
from from like uh, institutions or agencies like yours. So I think this is really uh, you made a good point in showing us uh, what what could be done if we if we get help, because especially in the social sciences and in the humanities, we are often alone or we are just small teams and we don't have the infrastructures and the resources to do all these things that could be done. And so there is a lot of potential that is untapped. And I think, yeah, I think uh, now uh, is the time to maybe rethink this attitude of trying to do everything alone. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the data management plans. And as you can see from my title, I, I took it a little bit on the ironic way to ask uh, who is afraid of the data management plan. Because normally when you when you uh, say the word, people roll their eyes and they go like, poof, data management plan, what, what a dry and boring topic. And what I'm trying to show you today is uh, that it it is indeed a little bit complicated and it requires some effort but it needn't to be so dry and uh, first and foremost it's really really helpful to do this and to turn a data management plan not into something that you just produce for a proposal to please a funder but to use it actually in your research as a very useful instrument so what is a data management plan that is so scary uh, it is a structured guide, most, more or less, I will show you. It can be a document it, or it can be uh, in part of an online tool that covers really the entire life cycle of data. And you know, I mean, you are from the social sciences, you know what, what data can be. I mean, there is a lot of different shades and formats and modes of data. So uh, really think about every kind of data that you uh, encounter in your research. So uh, in my uh, story that I am going to tell you, the data management plan is a living document and uh, that could be adapted and updated during the project. So it is a tool for efficient data management, but it's not data management itself uh, and it can be used across all research phases and beyond. So it should still be useful after the project end. And uh, it, it is like a collection of answers to questions on specific areas, like appropriate formats, standards, documentation, storage, archiving, and some of which Lisa has already talked about uh, before. And some one point that I forgot to put on this slide that might also be um, uh, important to remember is that a uh, data management plan is a plan. It's not a contract with the devil or something, you know, that you put your life on. It's a plan. And not all the planned things always work out, but at least uh, it, it was allowing you to think about things beforehand uh, to, to assess any risks and, and yeah, we'll come to that. So don't forget that. It's not something else. It's a plan. So why? Uh, a data management plan uh, and we have heard this already a little bit from, from Lisa, is, is helping you to plan, to manage, and reflect your data practices. And this is an important point that I want to make. It's really helping you uh, having this uh, reflexive uh, layer or dimension on, uh, uh, in, in addition to, to project management, normal project management activities. It makes your research more verifiable, uh, even maybe replicable, you know? Think about data papers. Uh, uh, they are, by the way, much easier to write when you have a good DMP at hand. I'm, I will come back to that later. Um, it uh, will help you to make your data understandable, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, uh, fair data, uh, not only to yourself, only to yourself, but also to uh, uh, research partners, research subjects, and others. We'll come back to that as well. So this will increase the reuse, and there is a lot of studies who, who which can show that already that this is happening. Uh, it will also increase the data benefits for the research partners and research subjects because they might also be interested in access to your data. And uh, it it helps you to prepare data for evidence-based decision making. Think about the policy science interfaces or, or things like that. And of course, it helps you to comply with funder mandates. And thanks to those funder mandates, we, we are now thinking more about those things that than we did before. Um, what does it look like? So there is, of course, like always, uh, two different versions, uh, the, the, 
the, the one that you put into a proposal and the one that I find much more interesting, the one that is this living document that you use in your actual research project. And the one that you put in your project, if you look at the requirements from funders, they are normally like two or three pages maximum because who wants to read all these data management plans? And they contain just a brief outlook uh, on, on the most important information regarding the data. And the point here is just to demonstrate that you are prepared and thoughtful um, in in your process strategy, if you think. Yeah? And the other data management plan, this one that is so important for your project management and for, for the whole reflection um, uh, options that you have in your project, is that that you use in your actual project. So like in my case, those data management plans in the end, they have like 150 pages if you count, if you have them stored in, in a document format. Uh, they are very dynamic. They are very messy sometimes uh, and, and need a lot of uh, cleaning. And um, they uh, are a really often a good uh, basis for a discussion. This is interesting sometimes because uh, you, on, because you have to do this or you have to get organized around the data means that you also have to discuss a lot with your research uh, partners uh, and your, uh, yeah, who else, who, who else is involved in, in these processes. Um, so uh, it is, it, it becomes really a tool to generate information about my work uh, that I could share later on as well. So uh, it could even, there are now experiments running with open data management plans that that uh, from projects that have not so much um, uh, sensitivity issues of the data, uh, which where where people look how how. Uh, good information from data management plans can be reused, for example, for repositories or to see what data is out there or what people, what kind of formats and modes of data people are using in their research. So there's quite interesting experiments going on. What are the core elements of a, of a data management plan? So first, there is the typical administrative information like project name, data originator, data owner, data controller, all these things that uh, sometimes are not so easy for newbies to understand and where I'm sure, of, for example, Oster would be able to help a lot uh, to... to um, yeah, to, to know, yeah, to, to get to grips with these things. Um, then you have the project management information, uh, like all these responsibilities uh, for the various data practices, but also the, the costs and resources associated with the data management. So this is a really important thing, sometimes very hard to estimate uh, when when you are not so sure where 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 this will go. And then you have details on the data, like formats, types, metadata, standards, storage, backup, security, long-term archiving, and all these like um, legal and ethical issues. We'll, we'll also come back to that in a bit. And when you think the, about the core elements that you have to put in a, in a data management plan that you also uh, add to a proposal, uh, you have to think about those things that I've put on the list normally. So if you look across the, the templates that were also put in the chat before, so there you can find those things. Basically, uh, it's important to describe the data, so what kind of data and how it was generated or collected, but also, and this is already pointing to fair and open uh, data reuse, uh, who might be the target audience for it? And this might be, uh, people from your community, researchers, but it might also be policymakers, or it might also be the the, the research subjects, the field uh, communities that you work with. It could also be other, other kinds of institutions. Um, then the important uh, point is uh, uh, you have to kind of already think beforehand about how you will best organize documentation metadata because this is normally, especially documentation in more data-driven projects, this is really very laborious and takes a lot of time. So this is also a budget issue. So it's really important to think about those things. And then of course, data quality. Yeah. We talked about fair already. So this is already putting some burden on, on some like um, infrastructure or resource low uh, uh, project uh, types, but 
then uh, data quality is really an important ex uh, uh, dimension of that as well, where you think about uh, if, you, if I want to share the data, especially uh, what kind of quality standards uh, would apply. And then it's also important, of course, that in, in, in the sense of findability, that at least the metadata is machine readable so that uh, search engines can actually find the, the contents or the, 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 at least the identifiers of your data. Okay, the availability, so the, the whole question of where do I put it, what kind of identifiers, I, those things are sometimes quite easy because sometimes you already know or you use always the same repository. But then you have to think about things like, so, okay, my data is crucial for my project. I should also think about how I back up it. Do I, where, where do I put the backups? Uh, and what will happen with the data after the project? So those things all also cost money. They cost time. And so it's important to think about those things beforehand, at least estimations not um not the um full you, you can't you can never be sure about the full amount in the end and then there is the big uh kind of block on ethical and uh, legal issues uh data ownership tricky questions sometimes uh, as lisa mentioned sometimes your organizations are co-owners or, or in the at least for the use and distribution rights for your data so i i I know that many people are not aware of this, for example, and I'm also really sure that with an institution like OSTA helping you on that, you'll find out about those things very easily. So licensing, reuse, uh, also derivatives, uh, uh, derivatives. So that is really important. There was the question in the chat. So how is reuse working? I mean, can people use my data and then publish with it? Yes. Uh, how is this? But how is this going? And what what would be your wishes uh, connected to that? So how would you like to handle this? It's really important to think about this before. And then the whole question of ethical barriers and considerations and sensitive data strategy. Uh, you have to think about: Can I really? Ha do I have a strategy for? Uh, destroying the data or deleting the data that is important to think about yeah so so it's really not something uh, that you should be well there's something that you should should be very mindful it's it's in in it's your obligation to your research subjects also to to provide a good strategy for those things and you know there is the right to be forgotten so how, how does it look in my research? Uh, I told you, sometimes those uh, data management plans at the end of a project, they have 150 pages, but they help me a lot. And uh, what what I really, in bigger projects, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm not doing it for every little side project, but I'm doing it for bigger and more complicated projects with a lot of partners, for example, um, and different formats also, different formats of data and different um, levels of data aggregation and, and analysis. So what I do is I really try to describe every data set that I have. And you know what a data set is. A data set can be a group of in interviews, but a data set can also be an annotated bibliography that you, that you that you can share. So everything, think about, be, be open-minded about project outputs. Our project outputs are not just publications and data sets. A lot of other things that come from your methods, that come from your approaches and workflows could be shared and could be turned into data for others. So this is important. So, so this is why I try in larger projects to have a description of every data set. And uh, then also uh, I, I found a, um, one approach particularly useful when you have larger projects is that you do kind of an, an interview situation with your project partners uh, where you ask them all these questions about their data plans and there you collect uh, their information then you can easily handle the, the complex relationships between the partners in the project and you can see already from the start uh, where could be potential uh, roadblocks or, or problems uh, in the, for example, issues of data control and sharing in even not with the outside world, but within 
a project. So this, this, uh, we did it. Um, Stephanie, I saw you here and Barbara, I saw you also here in, in, in several projects that we did together at ZSI, where we started at the beginning of the project to interview all the project partners, uh, about their, um, data management issues. And there we brought together all the necessary information to enrich the data management plan in the beginning of a project. So that was really, really helpful. Yeah, and in the end, you have this, this, this big pile of information about your data. And that is really helpful when you want to uh, prepare the data for reuse after a project, because you already know where all the data is, you know what licenses are attached to it, where, for example, the research subject might also have an interest in. So there is a lot of um, options and you have it right there on, on your on your computer and you don't have to go and uh, get everything, collect everything together and assemble this information once again. Um, one, I'm now going to show you some examples where, where it's really handy so to have such a DMP. Uh, this, some of them are more important for maybe quantitative uh, social research. Some might also fit very well to qualitative approaches. So think about the versioning of data. and. When I say data versioning, that sounds very technical, and you think immediately about dynamic data sets that change over time and so on. Uh, but think about uh, panel studies or studies that uh, are longitudinal and that uh, collect data over time. So there, it's this. This might be important also for qualitative uh, social science to kind of have an overview about how the data and the data structure and, for example, new variables come in and so on and so on. How this changes over time. Uh, it also gives you a really good overview about um, uh, uh, primary and secondary data use because normally uh, in, in more complex projects you mix that. No, You have your own data but then you for example use data from data providers or from colleagues that made their data open and you enrich the data, you produce data derivatives if you like, so like you add enhance existing data. And uh, so it's really hard in complex projects to keep track of those things. And so it's so important to have a good strategy in the beginning and a plan or a document where you can fill all this uh, process relevant information in during the project. So, and then also it helps you in the end when you have maybe even some commercial interests with your data or some other um, interests in exploitation to have have this information ready when you kind of, let me, let me say, package uh, your data products, if you like. So this might be, might be for some of you also an option after a project. Um, it's... We, we talked about briefly in the last session about informed consent, you know, I mean, sometimes in the social sciences, the informed consent is the only kind of contract we have with the research subjects. So it's uh, basically our single point of legal uh, of kind of negotiation of obligations. And with the GDPR and also the new e-privacy um, directive in the European Union, but with many other like issues of research integrity and, and, and research, responsible research and innovation, um, it is sometimes nice to give access to the data or at least to, to their to the data you collected together with them to the research subjects. And uh, you can see it from this example I took from a survey last week uh, that even in an anonymized survey, you have now the opportunity to give the people, for example, not access to the data, but here in this case, the option to have their data deleted, even if it's anonymized. So I think this is quite important nowadays. And this, again, uh, uh, brings about some kind of effort to manage those things. If you have a good data management plan, then you can already flag these instances of data where you will know, okay, so there I will have to think about it. In this survey, we will have to build in, for example, this option, even if it's anonymized, that people can opt out and have the data deleted. So all these things are really, really can get complicated when you don't have a good overview about uh, the data. Then 
uh, the whole topic of uh, data governance. I mean, there is so many different levels of principles and rules that to, of the many different types of data in large projects, um, uh, which relate more to the like policy side, which I put here under the label of governance, but also to infrastructures. You know, I mean, there is so much um, specific past dependencies that come from infrastructures and how you can then communicate on what's happening on these infrastructures. Uh, that is really important to have an overview about this. And then, of course, uh, as we said before, I mean, some of us were not aware that our uh, uh, employing organizations have some rights to the data that we collect and um, put together, right? So the organization and rules, these things are really also eye-opening sometimes when you when you have a good data management plan. And then, of course, the data management plan, especially in the beginning, but also during the project, helps you very much to assess the risks that can happen. Yeah, that can happen in terms of data quality. Yeah, uh, that can happen in terms of uh, metadata management, but also in in terms of money. For example, if 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 you need more and more data and you need to buy it from some data providers, or you have to cooperate with other institutions to get it, and you run out of budget, then this is not not a good situation yeah and uh, if you have a, a good planning document in the beginning at least you will be alerted uh, sometime before that that might become an issue yeah um, um data quality I, I already mentioned and then of course the whole security and privacy issues so you can also make yeah be be well aware of what issues might arise uh, at a certain part or point of a a, a project yeah Issues of, of reviewing data sets. I mean, this is also becoming more and more important uh, in, in, in areas that use, well, that, that produce data for decision making, yeah, um, that uh, data sets uh, can be reviewed. And also some conferences also require that by now, which is an interesting issue in itself, I have to say, because I was, I, was, I, I do this sometimes and I'm <laughs> confronted with a lot of uh, problems because sometimes it's just really hard to, for reviewing a data set that has like, I don't know, 25 gigabytes and how can you open that on your mobile phone? Not, not really. So, <laughs> so thinking about these things, it, it really makes sense. Yeah. Uh, then uh, I already mentioned external data providers, but and data sources. I mean, I, uh, for example, I did uh, for some time. I did uh, social media research, and there you have all you are confronted with all these different policies by social media platforms, and how you can reuse their data, uh, and how this is also related to. The, the the personal identifiable information and how you want to treat in a way the, the 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 people that are the producers of this content that you are for example scraping from somewhere so so this is really important to think about and also how to manage that afterwards because for example when you download a twitter data set of course you're actually not allowed to make it reusable. It still belongs to Twitter. And uh, there is a lot of open questions, not only ethical ones, but also organizational ones attached to this. Uh, uh, how how could I, and what, what would it mean to enhance a Twitter data set? Could I then make this open and shareable as also, for example, to, to verify my own research? So there is a lot of open questions here that are not so easy to answer. And the, the earlier you think about it, the better. Um, uh, but also things like insecurity or, or privacy. I mean, think about uh, the transcription services or uh, translation services or visualization services. Are, are those partners or these companies or these people that I work together with, do they uh, um, uh, comply with uh, the GDPR and things like that? Yeah. So there's a lot of questions that, that you can actually think about before when you have this planned in a right way. And then, of course, uh, what can be shared and what makes sense to be shared? What data might be useful for others? Uh, what data do I use to verify or replicate my research? And what we already had in the chat, what is my, what if my data is too sensitive to share? It makes no sense at all to share sensitive data and then to even to, even if you have it uh, pseudonymized, it's not really helpful probably. So if I, if I find out that I, 
want to share things, but maybe it's not the data that I can share. Maybe it's very different things. Yeah. When you think about biographical research, for example, one form of aggregation of biographical research that can easily be um, uh, anonymized even is visualization, it's structures, it's a structural view on um, uh, kind of movements of people or or uh, like um, social behaviors, if you like. Yeah? But then also think about your workflows, your methods, uh, your coding systems. Um, uh, what I said before, annotated bibliographies. I mean, there's a lot of things you could actually share from your research, which wouldn't count as traditional data, data, um, uh, social science data. And this you can find out when you, when you think about what you will generate in a project. And uh, last but not least, I already mentioned it, uh, the, the data management plan comes super handy when you have to write data papers. So this is something that probably not all of you will do. This is more for quantitative uh, social science, data-driven social sciences, where this is now starting. And here I put for you the general properties of a data paper, what most journals uh, ask for at the moment, and what, what you have to put in such a data paper, where you have to explain and describe. And if you have your data management plan set up with this information, you, it's ba basically, you, you, it, it, you can, it, it writes your data paper automatically. So yeah, nah, maybe that's a little bit um, overrated, but, <laughs> but at least that's the direction where it goes. So, so it helps you really to do this. So it makes it much easier to write those papers. And a lot of conferences already have these formats also, not only journals. And then, as I said, the data management plan is not the data management itself. I think there, Lisa has demonstrated very uh, colorfully what, what are the dimensions of uh, research data management. But the, the, the important thing is uh, the data management plan is this point where data management and project management also comes together and uh, where you can have or at least uh, become an overview about what will be the necessary uh, governance issues, the necessary infrastructure issues, and the whole question of how do I organize this and what roles do and what people and what skills do I need uh, to handle all these things. Yeah. And of course, it becomes more and more complicated the bigger the project gets and the more people are involved. But uh, even when you are doing a project alone, that will generate some kind of output uh, where publications and typical data is one, but maybe also some other things, uh, such uh, planning can really be useful to, to yeah, to, just to see uh, what issues will arise. And uh, as we have already, yeah, had in, we had it in the chat already. Uh, so, so data management plans are now becoming obligatory elements in proposals. Uh, for example, the Austrian Science Fund has it now, but also foundations like the Volkswagen Stiftung, they use a template based on the Science Europe template. And now from 2021 uh, in Europe, for example, also the ERC is not allowing apl applicants anymore to opt out of this uh, data management plan thing. Even if, if you say that all your data is sensitive and you cannot share anything, you still have to fill it out uh, and explain what kinds of data you're going to um, um, produce or uh, use. And then, of course, Horizon Europe, the new framework program, the European Union framework program with a very strong focus on open science, uh, has also this obligation to produce a data management plan. What I want to say here is, uh, it is not always clear how the data management plans are reviewed. In most cases, this is not done by the external reviewers, but by the, 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 the administration that is administering the, the calls. And they look more or less for compliance and not so much on the contents of it. But I think what we will see in the future is that those data management plans will become more genuine parts of proposals, also uh, the, the content part of a proposal. And I think, especially when, when it's about big projects, this will be definitely reviewed then by the external reviews as well. But maybe this is a topic for the, for the discussion. 
And then I put in some further information, which some of you have already posted in the chat as well. And I think it's also important here to note that, of course, the data management planning should always be linked to the question of research integrity and the, 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 the code of conduct and ethics in research, like also the, the question of responsible research. Because it is really something, and we are here in the social sciences, so we know our like dark uh, histories or blind spots or things in some disciplines have been especially prominent in the last years of uh, yeah showing that they failed to reach some uh, even limits or standards of of um, research integrity. So we should be especially reflexive on those. Uh, things and think about how we can make it better uh, than like our ancestors have done it in the last, yeah, in the last uh, uh, hundred years, two hundred years sometimes. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope I could provoke some thoughts on you. And yeah, uh, we we are here for questions. Maybe also together with what has been presented in the first um, uh, session. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katja. Katja, thank you very much for your enlightening presentation. You not only showed us that the TMP is not a contract with the devil, mm -hmm. but also gave us an important insight into your work. Um, very helpful also to consider what to share if you can share the data. I think it's very important to do so. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? No questions. Uh, too much. No questions. Too much input. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can also use the microphone if you want. Yeah, people should be uh, uh, able to speak up. Uh, they, I think uh, we have a. I can now stop the presentation. Then maybe we can switch on the cameras. I can try that. And uh, yeah. Someone typing. You can see. It was a very good input, Katja Meyer. Mm -hmm. um, another question, you mentioned uh, deleting data after anonymization. How is that done? Oh, yeah. So that it, there's different, different uh, dimensions of this question now. So uh, uh, sometimes people do a project and I'm uh, I myself uh, did that uh, before I was becoming more reflexive on these things, where I had my surveys, my interviews, and all these things, and I stored it on my uh, business laptop from the university or other institutions, and I made some Excel files, I aggregated, analyzed, blah, blah, blah. I never encrypted uh, their, um, the files where I put in all this information because I thought it's my laptop, nothing can happen. And then I, uh, the project ended. I uh, left maybe even the institution or the uh, thing. I had to give the computer back and I had no time to really uh, think about those things and just, uh, for example, deleted uh, the file structure from the from the hard drive. But that's, of course, not enough. Uh, when you have sensitive data, you really have to make sure that you wipe it out uh, when, when it's due date uh, to that, uh, when you don't have the right to keep it longer. Uh, the same with audio transcriptions of interviews, for example, you know, sometimes, I mean, they are even sometimes more sensitive, um, uh, that, that, that audio files are more sensitive than the transcriptions. So the idea is really that you take some time or maybe get some help, uh, technical help, to know how you really delete files, especially when they are on infrastructure that is shared. But uh, normally it, 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 it's enough to just uh, yeah, reconfigure the hard drive just to, to fully delete it and then uh, uh, set it up new, reset in a way the whole, the whole system. Uh, we don't have to go shreddering hard drives. Uh, I mean, not at least in my fields of research. Uh, the politicians do that sometimes. Okay, thank you. So there's another... Some people are typing now. 
I think the whole the, the the questions that were raised before, you know, this this whole question of informed consent, uh, the, the the question of reuse, you know, this scientific purpose. I think this is something where a data management plan can help a bit, but this can also be not solved with with a good planning because uh, in the, the the core idea of reuse is that maybe some people will come and think about things to do with your data that you have never thought about and this will be super innovative then uh so i think this is really something where where we all have to think more about in in the next years how we can still stay true to our research subjects but also leave this option there that it can be uh that it stays reusable that is a really important point so there are now questions yeah there's now a question yes and also a comment uh but if those data is anonymous it is not necessary to delete well that is no that is not the case uh, all the time so this is also something where Austria, i'm sure can help you this is a question also of long-term preservation um Things that might be anonymous now might not be anonymous uh, 10 years from now. Yeah. So, so that those are questions that, of course, I cannot solve this here at the moment, but it's a little bit comp more complicated than this. And also with anonymized data in an informed consent procedure, you basically have to say how long the data will be stored. And uh, I don't know how it is with the GDPR. Maybe others know better. I, I'm not sure that you can keep it, that it's, it's so simple to keep it indefinitely for, uh, for um, uh, uh, any kind of duration. Uh, if you do this, you should at least be able to make sure that uh, you have a contract with the devil because then you can foresee uh, the infrastructures that will be there to keep the data forever. May I add something here? Uh, because uh, this is a topic that I deal with at Austria as well. And it's also my understanding that if the data is not longer falls under, G under the GDPR, so there is no uh, regulation coming out from the general data protection regulation that says that you need to delete the data. This would be um, my understanding as well. My question here would be what you said is um, because anonymization is uh, usually thought about as a ultimate status, I would say, so that there's no more possibility ever to make this data non-anonymous. And you mentioned that if data is now anonymous, it might not be anonymous in 10 years. Can you elaborate on this? Because Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is where, what comes up sometimes, especially when you deal with sensitive data, maybe also at the interface with health data and stuff like that. So the, the question here is um, what what standards we have nowadays for anonymization, if they will still be there in 10 years. And also, uh, it's, it's not maybe a question of uh, data protection as we see it now or how the regulation is now, but it's a question of research integrity. So if, if you kind of make promises to the people or if you have a certain impact intended of your research and the, the data is then maybe used, uh, it's preserved, but and maybe used for for things that you would not support. Yeah, then at least it's not so simple to say that we keep it forever. It's anonymized. So it, there is, for example, um, uh, conditions that or, or socio demographic data that uh, was collected uh, 15 years ago without thinking about it and now this would be considered sensitive information right think about before when th those of you who still remember that you where you had to fill out your uh, uh, religion for example all the time and this was i mean there was even uh, uh, in, there was some scandals or breaches where these data that are now considered sensitive were not, that were not considered like 20 or 25 years ago so sensitive were, um, yeah, leaked and, and reused, uh, for other purposes, you know. And so those are the situations where we as researchers have sometimes to go beyond the, the data protection rules we really have to be mindful about that yeah and think about i don't know sometimes it's hard to think about things that you cannot know yet but uh relation think about how now uh with for example social media platforms data is brought together and aggregated over different platforms about you so when when cambridge analytica said they have five thousand data points on each person yeah um 
there, I'm sure there were some things inside that have not been considered sensitive, but in the combination of, of, of issues, uh, uh, people could be then uh, identified. And of course, this is what uh, all these ad tech and marketing companies nowadays do. So we, we shouldn't, we should really always go beyond that and think uh, uh, what can be done also in combination of data. Yes. Um, there's another question. Um, I was also thinking about your right to be forgotten. Is that satisfied by anonymization? Well, it's a, normally I would say yes. I mean, in, in most of the cases, uh, uh, yes. But as I said, you know, we have to be very mindful about this. And when we, uh, when some of us work on uh, political issues or uh, people uh, from the peripheries of society or, I don't know, the things that are in a way uh, not the norm, yeah, or that where there is not the, the, the bigger part of the population involved, sometimes it gets easier and easier in the combination of variables, in the combination of information to make, uh, to kind of re-engineer identification if you really want to do it. And um, unfortunately in history, there is a lot of, ugly uh, uh, examples also of uh, uh, ruthless governments who then engage in this sort of processes, but also companies, of course, and um, law enforcement agencies, yeah, things like that. So, so there is uh, unfortunately more to think about than sometimes the, the, the regulation that we have today can help us with. Okay. Thank you. Christiane, I can see you, your name. Do you have a question? Okay. So we have another question. Um, as far as I know, uh, TMPs are not obligatory for proposals for most funders. They are requested after approval, for example, FWF, but is there a tendency that it would become more common to have a DMP ready in proposal status? Katja, we can't, I cannot hear you now. Sorry, double click. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we see this tendency. So uh, that's why I said, so normally, but but this will be very different formats. Uh, the, the DMPs that funders already request, like the Volkswagen Stiftung, for example, I think, um, and others at the, at the proposal stage, they are very short. They just should demonstrate uh, that you have thought about this and that that you are aware what kind of data need, what kind of uh, handling and planning and budget. Yeah. And also in terms of uh, what kind of open strategy you are going to plan. Uh, so, yeah, we will definitely see that being more integrated in the proposal stage. And yes, most funders uh, require a data management plan in the first six months after the project start. And uh, that's that's useful because then you have to have some time to develop also with the project partners uh, this uh, kind of yeah information gathering, and yeah. So I, I I would say I would agree. Yes, we see a tendency that it becomes more and more appropriate for funders to mainstream this into the proposal uh, structure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another very interesting question. Um, a problem I have in the qualitative social sciences is that the analysis is often from quite a specific angle point of view. We analyze things from quite a specific perspective. Other people might analyze the same content, let's say policy documents, in a completely different way. Isn't this a problem when it comes to reuse? No, that's the good thing about reuse. Then at least we have multiple uh, perspectives. Uh, I can, uh, I'm a big fan of that uh, coming from uh, feminist epistemology. So uh, um, uh, the thing, I mean, for the, this is a good example. So for example, you have a corpus of documents um, coming from media or from institutions that you have analyzed. So it would be on a special topic or, or related to some incidents or events. Uh, so First, it would be super handy if we could share the corpus of documents. In most cases, we cannot because we don't have the copyrights uh, for, for sharing these. So we can only share some kind of links or pointers that um, 
point to this to these documents, which makes it not so nice. For example, if you run some uh, uh, computer supported uh, analysis tools and so on. Um, so uh, first of all, this is anyway sometimes hard to share. Uh, this is the first problem with it. And the second problem with it is that um, the 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 uh, your your point of view or the angle of analysis which sometimes uh, people think only qualitative research has but all research has in my opinion uh, is uh, that what I would say would in it's in our responsibility to share as much the position that that we speak from so the more you you share things that kind of also show uh, the, the the position from where you anal you do your analysis uh, the better uh, and this is something that uh, could could be done for example in data papers in an innovative form of data papers uh, in the social sciences that are more reflective and that think also more about the limits and and uh, the limitations also of not only the data we have at hand but also our viewpoints and our instruments that we then put on the data. So I would say um, that is not so much a problem than uh, the, still the lack of innovative formats of how to deal with this. And uh, data is not objective. Uh, I would very strongly disagree with linking those things together. Data is data. It's something that is uh, collected by some instruments that, you know, uh, uh, technology is frozen politics. So each instrument has a lot of decisions frozen in itself. So every every thing that we use to collect some data, even if, uh, if it's just a notebook and a pen, uh, sh shows us the world in a special way. And the more we document this and share this, the better. Thank you. Um, another question. You talked about using data from Twitter feeds earlier. How does anonymization oh. play out when we use publicly available and shared data? Yeah, that's a big problem. Uh, the, 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 the common use of, of data from social media like Twitter is that it's, it's because it's public. Uh, many people think uh, it's not sensitive because people have put it there and we can just scrape it. But that's, of course, not true. First of all, it's not true because Twitter is actually not really allowing this. Uh, and then, of course, it's not really allowing the reuse. And then also we have some kind of obligation to think about um, ethics, research ethics. And it's... Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Even if you use Twitter data, you should try to anonymize it. But it's very hard. You, it's very hard to do that because uh, it, there is no machine learning that can do it by now. And uh, it's also, uh, even if you anonymize the usernames in the tweets, for example, there's a lot of references to other people. And so it's it's pretty hard to do this. So I, I'm always quite hesitant of sharing such data sets, uh, yeah, if they are not uh, uh, coming with super pressing issues. You know, it's done all the time. I mean, those data sets are shared everywhere. And when when I, for example, review at conferences where people present these data sets, uh, I'm shocked uh, how unreflected their use is. Some, some of these people don't even bother to look at the policies of the the media social media platforms where they t where they scrape the data from and um, so we are not having ethical issues in regard to the people that are mentioned in those data sets uh, and that are represented there but we also have ethic uh, we have also have uh, uh, like legal issues because these data sets how they in the way these data sets are created so social media research is a is a very complicated topic and then when we when we generalize these questions to publicly available data then um i still think we have to strike the balance uh in in the research in order not to uh yeah or at least to to see that we are not um emphasizing or highlighting certain individuals too much because this is again maybe coming from our instruments and our position so when we when we share data sets uh, on specific topics that have a lot of people data inside then we still have to be careful with it at least even if it's publicly available and we have to explain a lot about this data set and we have to engage with it 
we cannot just put it somewhere and think, uh, yeah, so my instrument now, for, for example, think about a public discourse that you want to map and, and because your instrument was uh, directed to some left wing, right wing, uh, I don't know, uh, tweeting, yeah, whatever. And you then have just those people in the data set and you don't describe it well enough, then it might to reusers look as if this is kind of um, showing some sort of public arena that is not there uh, when you don't have this um, information on, on how you sampled the data, for example. Very interesting, thank you. Um, there's a sighting of Barent Mons, uh, Data Stewardship for Open Science. Generating research data without an executable data stewardship plan is scientific malpractice. I find it interesting to think about DMPs as an element of good scientific practice. What do you say? Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Uh, uh, data stewardship, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting term. Uh, some people also call it data curation, if you like. So, uh, there is, uh, people think there is something like raw data. People still think that, yeah, that it's like something you can take from a tree and then bite in it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, it's, that's not there. There is nothing like raw data. And, uh, the, the moment we, we generate or collect data, uh, some kind of instruments and perspectives are involved. And that's why uh, the stewardship should already start here to think about, to be reflective in our practices, but also then of course, think about how, when I make this reusable or when I share, when I make this shareable or when I wake my, when I, when I, when I open up my research processes so that my, my research can be replicated, for example, we have to think about what we share and what we share about the methods that we used. And of course, maybe also the, the, the context of time. Think about what a data, what, how much, for example, in social sciences, the, the socio-political, socio-demographic, uh, environmental context um, makes with what we are doing, right? So in, in fact, data stewardship would also mean that you explain uh, the point of time when you did this research. The, the, the social circumstances. Thank you, Katja. Uh, next um, comment um, or question. Uh, thank the post presenters for the interesting insights. What about data sharing and confidential agreements in projects of applied sciences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, that's a, an ongoing discussion that's also not very helpful for opening up institutions like the FFG in Austria and others. So um, the that's, yeah, I mean, there are reasons why you can't share. I mean, you can't share sensitive data and you can't share data that is uh, kind of uh, uh, not, uh, that, that would reveal some company secrets. Uh, which would be good for the competitors. Uh, so you can't share a lot of data. Uh, so you can't, you simply can't share it, uh, the data. But what you could do is you could think about what you can share about the data or what you can share about the methods. Um, uh, and sometimes meta information is already a lot of, uh, of a lot of knowledge that is not there yet, but would help others to, to know more about this. So in applied research, in applied sciences, where you have also pri private public, public partnerships and so on, I think we have to become more innovative in what we can, sh thinking about what we can share when we cannot share the, the data. Sometimes you can, for example, in, in the life sciences, uh, we see a lot of examples where uh, data and like, data workflows around the data are not shared, but sometimes pipelines are shared or bigger bigger steps like process management information is shared. That can be quite insightful and helpful to know. Thank you, that's very important, yes. Uh, another question, are there any differences between private individuals and persons of public interest? I mean, with regards to privacy rights and so on. Well, I'm not a, a, a legal scholar. Uh, I, I'm also sure Lisa knows much more about this. So uh, uh, there um, are definitely 
uh, but I don't know where the continuum is kind of working. Yeah, so um, as Katja said, I'm also uh, not uh, a lawyer, but um, this is actually one very difficult topic that we're dealing with and that we still need to figure out. As far as I know, there's no difference um, in the GDPR, so especially with regards to data protection. I would see it more in the sense of, um, because there is an exception for the reuse um, for the scientific purpose, if this data has been already has already been publicly available. And I think this could make uh, a difference in this regard, because when you talk about persons of public interest and you want to process data, then you didn't gather this data because you probably you didn't personally ask them in a uh, survey that needs to be protected. But this is information that is already publicly available. And then there are some exceptions. Um, what you can do with the data with regard to scientific reuse. And I think from the argumentation perspective, this is more the angle that we need to come from. But um, also, to be honest, this is not, um, this is a very difficult question and we're still trying to figure out how to deal with this. But it is super important in terms of what we can share also afterwards or, uh, or on what can we build our data and then share uh, derivatives of the data, for example. It's a super, I mean, a lot of those questions are not solved. Yeah. There is no, the, the legal frameworks are just developed for, for those things at the moment. Uh, we are, we are not there yet. No, you're right. We are far away from it now. Yes. Thank you. I can't see another question now. And we have three minutes left. Um, Oh, one more question. Shouldn't uh, there be more emphasis on the context surrounding the data, especially in qualitative social science research, field research, and so on? And how could this be accounted for in the data management plan and especially in the metadata? Any tips? Yeah, definitely. There shouldn't be much more emphasis. Um, and the data management plans as we have them now, the templates you will see when you look at them, are not very much uh, equipped to, to deal with that. But uh, if I would be a reviewer um, and I would see a, a, a a, person, a, a researcher having adapted those data management plans in exactly for those questions, I would be super happy. <laughs> I will rate it very high because this is exactly the, the important things that uh, in, in especially in qualitative uh, and more if you want intersubjective social research, uh, we, we have to document. Those are the things that are sometimes uh, well, we, did, we, we didn't have a lot of good strategies for that in, in many of the, the methods we used um, in the last, um, yeah, hundreds of years. So there, there's some need to do that then. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katja. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for your questions, for your input. I think it was um, very um, good to hear uh, from your point of view, the, the questions about data management plans and, and research data management. And we will continue our webinar, I think, I hope, I'm sure. <laughs> um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, if my colleagues uh, want to add something, please feel free to take the microphone. If not, um, I say thank you to you all and have a nice day. And maybe we um, we uh, meet in, a, in another um, surrounding and let's talk then uh, together about data management and everything you want, data management plans and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.